their homeland. They should not be uprooted and moved. Um, he talked about Milosevic's genocide. I asked, what is the foreign policy of this administration? Over a half million people were killed um, uh, uh, in, in other African countries, and nothing was done about it. I mean, if we're talking about genocide and the loss of lives, certainly that would have been the standard. And we just heard the president in his press conference saying they were a little slow in recognizing the slaughter and the genocide in that area. So if it's genocide is the issue, there are certainly more areas around the world that qualify. And if you look, if you looked at the a recent press conference that were held at the State Department, and they talked about the number of lives that were lost in um, in this area of the world in Yugoslavia uh, after January before this war started, they would say it was less than 20. So what is the standard? Armstrong, are you suspect of President Clinton's motives for getting involved right here, right now? It, it, it makes no sense if he's talking about human atrocities, uh, if he's talking about genocide. It makes no sense considering what has happened in other areas in the world. When you talk about a half a million people dying and where they were pulling that soldier's body apart and just f flinging it in the street, I mean, obviously it is suspect. I just don't understand what the foreign policy is, and maybe there is no foreign policy when it, uh, standard when it comes to this president. Well, Gary, what about that? Why get involved in Kosovo when there are uh, ethnic uh, uh, controversies flaring all over the world? Well, in all due respect, respect to Mr. Armstrong. I mean, I think this is just another example of a cadre of people that are being tough on Clinton and soft on Milosevic. And I don't think what? that, be, I don't think uh, because that uh, uh, we're not dealing with barbarism in other parts of the world means that we have to ignore barbarism in Europe. Uh, there is a major problem here. And I don't think that looking at two million people that are in the process of being displaced, two million people, and we're seeing the pictures of what's happening in them on television. This is no uh, simple situation here. It's a very serious situation, and we have to do something to deal with it. But they're all as serious. Are you saying a half million people dying is not serious? I'm saying... Compared to the number that died in, in that in the Mr. region Armstrong, of Yugoslavia? I'm saying, I'm saying that when there's a fire burning in the house next door to you, uh, you take care of that fire before you take care of the fire but down the street. But that fire happened before and we the, have fire... An the Europe, This is in Europe. It has to do with NATO security, and we do have an obligation to NATO. All right, we're going to have to leave our discussion there. Armstrong Williams, Gary Kokolari, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. This Albanian-American citizen was here to welcome them, and he stood out hoping his relatives might be among the lucky ones who made it here. Helping to welcome them at Fort Dix, at a gym that's been turned into an immigration center, the First Lady. Our hearts and our prayers have been with you, and now we want to show you that our hearts and our homes are open to you as well. But perhaps an even more welcoming sight, clean cots, cribs, and even teddy bears. All of this is being funded by the federal government, but many relief agencies are helping out donating everything from clothing to swing sets. Uh, the Red Cross will be involved. Um, I would expect through the duration as long as Health and Human Services sees a need for our role. That's just the first wave of refugees. Another 400 will be coming here to Fort Dix on Friday, and another 3,000 are scheduled to come through here in the next few weeks. At Fort Dix, Molly Falconer, Fox News. Joining us now to talk more about this, Gary Kokolari. He is with the Albanian Heritage Foundation. Thanks very much for coming in. How many of these refugees want to go home as soon as they can? Well, right now, the large percentage of them are saying they do want to go back to Kosovo. So, in fact, they're, they are here very temporarily. Well, that's another issue. Um, my own opinion is that once they get to the United States, uh, it may be more difficult to get them back to Kosovo. What about the next step? I mean, we've taken the first step of, of bombing the Serbian forces in Kosovo very severely. Uh, the next step, hopefully, is getting the, the Kosovars back into Kosovo. How do we go about doing that? Well, firstly, there's going to be, there's been a discussion going on about security forces, and NATO is going to have to be part of that force, and I believe there are going to have to be U.S. troops that are part of it to get the confidence of the Kosovars. Uh, then they're going to have to guide them into Kosovo, they're going to have to go with them. It's going to be difficult because they've seen the atrocities, because they've had the uh, horror of being forced from their homes, but they do want to go back to their homeland. And now, I have heard from some relief organizations that even if they don't have a home to go back to, even if their homes have been burned, they're willing to go back in with, with, with plastic sheets to set up temporary shelters. Do you think that's true? I believe it's true. From what we're hearing from the refugees in the camps, they very much want to get back to Kosovo. And how much are we going to have to take part in reconstructing that which we have bombed? We're obviously going to have to be part of that, but we're going to have to make sure that the Europeans pay their fair share.
Do you know how long this process might take? It's we're talking years we're and talking, years? We're talking years. Uh, you know, we don't even know what percent of the homes have been burned down, but you can be sure that it's been a substantial percentage of the, uh, the housing infrastructure. Now, there is a man named Ibrahim Rugova who is a peaceful participant in, in the Kosovo liberation movement, the movement to liberate Kosovo from Serbia. He's now in Italy. It was, it was told that he was under, under uh, guard in Serbia. He's now free in Italy with his family. Is he going to play a part in negotiating a settlement to this? Uh, we're waiting to see what words come out of his mouth. Um, we're going to have to treat what he says and what he does with a bit of caution. Him being released from Kosovo was obviously a surprise. He was under house arrest. We don't know the circumstances under uh, which he was being, we don't know what type of treatment he was receiving. Do you think Milosevic service. might still be applying the screws well, to him? If he has his family out, it may be difficult to do that, but we're still going to have to see what his position is. He hasn't spoken yet, at least not publicly, and we're all anxiously waiting to see what he says about the Kosovo conflict and how it's resolved. Gary Kukulari, thanks very much for coming in. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. This is going to be a little tough uh, for these people over the next few days. They're a long way from home. They're trying to settle in. What, what's being done to try to make them feel more comfortable? Well, they've also gone through a, quite a bit of trauma. Uh, I know that uh, some of the members of, of the uh, Kosovo Relief Fund have gone out there today to bring them some things, the toys and candy and things like that for the children to make them a little more welcome. There's also a group coming in this evening, and uh, several of our members are going out to greet them at the airport. So we're trying to at least put some friendly faces in front of them so that maybe they can you know, have something to remind them of home. Yeah, I mean, this has got to be, I can't imagine being uprooted from your home uh, under the direst of circumstances, put on a plane, shipped halfway around the world. These are people who are not at all familiar with our culture whatsoever. This is going to be kind of a tough adjustment. It's going to be a very difficult adjustment. Again, uh, especially after what they've gone through, and I'd like to you know, remind some of your viewers that we've set up the Kosovo Relief Fund here in New York specifically to help them with this issue. Uh, if I can just say one thing, because sure. I, ha I have to tell you, I, I was watching your viewer before this, and I've been on other programs with her before, and uh, you know, quite frankly, when I watch her, I think I've entered the twilight zone, because apparently she has difficulty uh, discerning the difference between fact and fiction, and also has difficulty discerning uh, between something that's unintentional and intentional. Uh, I, I don't think any of the Americans believe that the bombs that are dropping there on these sites, the collateral damage is, is, in, is intentional. But I can tell you that there are things that are intentional, like when the Serbs went into the Jashari compound in in Kosovo and took a seven-month pregnant woman and, and stuck a, a knife into her belly and killing her and the baby. Or like when they went into the uh, uh, Dranica and took the Delii baby and, and 30 other members of that family and killed them. And I'm talking about women and children in addition to taking that 18-month-old baby and putting a bullet in its head point-blank range. And I'm talking about the two women that walked out of Kosovo two days ago. One, a 19-year-old woman uh, who was a virgin, who was raped by three Serb soldiers. And her sister-in-law, 26 years old, who was raped by three Serb soldiers in front of her two-year-old daughter and her four-year-old son. So I'd like to know what Danielle thinks about that. And sometime I'd like to be able to sit here on the show again with her so we can discuss that matter. I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. We'll try to set that up and see if we can't make it happen. I think it would be for interesting television and perhaps enlightening, too. Listen, I'm sorry our time is short. Thank you. Thank you for I having appreciate me here. Your viewpoint. Thanks a lot for joining You're us. Coming welcome. up, we'll get an insider's look. Well, now that Kosovar has been liberated, will both Serbian and Albanian Kosovars be able to enjoy peace in their homeland together? More on this with Gary Kokolari from the Albanian Heritage Foundation and in Washington, Natalia Jurikovic. She's from the Serbian Unity Congress. Thank you both for coming in. Natalia, let me go to you first. Even Arkan, the ethnic cleanser from the Serbian forces, has said that Kosovo is now lost to Serbia. Do you agree? Um, I would have to say that I do agree because the agreement that was implemented at this point wasn't implemented fairly. There are approximately 70,000 Serbs that have fled Kosovo as a result of this agreement. They are now living on the border of Kosovo in southern Serbia. I heard KLA commander earlier say that the Serbs who had nothing to do with ethnic cleansing had uh, nothing to fear. That's not true. Our Bishop Artemia from Prizren 
was, if you will, ethnically cleansed from Kosovo because the German sector could not guarantee his protection because the Albanian KLA had surrounded his monastery and had forced many of his himself and many of his priests out. Those were people who actually had nothing to do with ethnic cleansing. Well, yet. and Gary, even beyond that, a lot of those priests up in the north of Kosovo actually protected the ethnic Albanians who came for sanctuary to their churches. Is there any way to protect the good Serbs who have played no part in the ethnic cleansing? Well, I believe the Albanians will, will try to maintain a peace. I think they will try to be fair. Uh, as as uh, Commander Drini said before, though, this, uh, you know, there are some Serbs uh, that uh, uh, maybe do deserve retribution. Uh, let's face it. Uh, the well, at least deserve to be punished, perhaps. Retribution implies that there's been a trial. Well, You're not suggesting they should be, should be summarily shot. Well, I'm not suggesting they should be summarily shot. However, um, this, uh, um, I'm, not, I'm sorry, Natalia, Natalia Jorkovic was talking about the, uh, uh, the Serbs that uh, have left Kosovo. Well, they left on their own accord. And there's a big difference between That's them. not true. They left on their own accord. No. And it's a big difference between the one and a half million Al Kosovars that were told leave or die and displaced from their homes. Well, Natalia, he who's forcing out the Serbs at gunpoint? The KLA is forcing them out at That's gunpoint. That's a bold I have lie, contact. Man. I have, no it's not, That's I have lie, contact man. with the bishop, I have contact with many people who live in Kosovo on a daily basis, and the Serbs are telling me that the KLA is forcing them out in droves well, at gunpoint and giving them five minutes to get out They're doing the same thing the Serbs have been doing all along. Homes. They're lying. Well, the KLA and, and nationalist Albanian forces have been doing this to Serbs since 1940. It happened in the 1940s, it happened in the 1980s. Hundreds of thousands the of KLA Serbs, didn't exist exactly in the 1940s, 350 man. The KLA didn't exist in the 1940s. Their predecessors did, huh? that were the Skanderbeg division. Their predecessors did exist. Well, Albanian well, again, nationalist This is another forces. misrepresentation. It's getting no, away from the fact of the thousands of Albanians that have been Holocaust slaughtered over the past Museum. few months, ma'am. But you know, folks, it's getting right to the point that are we ever going to solve? Look, I mean, it's you, very two, you two clearly it's not have. Going to be wait a minute, solved. Gary. Just a second. You two clearly have a lot of differences. There are a lot of tensions between the Albanians and the Serbian communities. Is there any way that these two communities can live together peacefully in the Balkans? It's very difficult. They can difficult. stop killing Serbs now. That would be a good start. It's very, what did and you say? Can stop throw, stop they can kill stop killing Serbs what, right you, now. You are out of your mind, man. Can, they just slaughtered tens of, of thousands of Albanians and moved a million and a half from the house. So stop this chicken little stuff. This is not chicken little stuff. This is stuff. chicken this little is stuff. This is exactly it's, what's it's happening. It's continual forced factual bishop, misrepresentation. church the figure, Serbs are genocidal killers. They've killed no. over half a million people in, no, in, in the Serbs they've are not killed over half a million people over the past years. The same applies to the Albanians in the 1980s and the thousands of you're living in the Twilight Zone. Gary and Natalia, I'm sorry, Twilight Zone or not, clearly this is a situation in the Balkans. It's going to be a long time before these ills are put to rest. Stay tuned. We'll be right back here on Fox News. There's a missile launching system and 2,600 troops to Albania so NATO can strike Serb troops and tanks in Kosovo. But is it too little too late? Some at the Pentagon think so. Reports today say in the weeks before NATO airstrikes began, some members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff expressed deep reservations about President Clinton's approach to the crisis in Kosovo. The top military brass reportedly had doubts that the air campaign alone would be effective in Yugoslavia, and they questioned whether U.S. interests were really at stake. Defense Secretary William Cohen said the reports are not correct, but they do raise questions about the President's ability to lead troops into battle. We'll talk to former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger about the crisis in Kosovo. I'm Chris Matthews. Let's play hard in 1965, the United States went to ground troops in Vietnam, largely to support the air campaign, which was under effect at the time. Here we go again, an escalation. We're putting ground troops into neighboring Albania to support what looks to be a ground war conducted by Apache helicopters in Kosovo against the Serbs. Joining me from New York, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger, what do you make of the latest development in the war? I don't think we should uh, analyze this war in it's, it's sort of a retail operation in which every day there is some new uh, marginal measure we have to take. When the United States engages itself in war, there is uh, no substitute for victory. And we have to do what is necessary uh, to prevail. I frequently expressed doubts before we went in there uh, about whether the United States should make the Balkans a central point of its foreign policy. 
uh, but now that we are in, uh, I believe that we have to do what is necessary, and if that requires ground troops, we have to send ground troops. And in any event, we ought to assemble the troops that might be needed now and not uh, wait three weeks and then make another decision. Just a few days ago, we saw three U.S. service people picked up. They were driving in a Humvee uh, around the border of Yugoslavia in, in, in uh, Macedonia. And now, just a few days after that, we find that no longer are we participating in that sort of peacekeeping mission, but we are, in fact, uh, we are in fact uh, uh, deploying troops to serve as uh, defenders of Apache helicopters, which will be based in Albania. Doesn't that seem to be a change of position from a more narrow war conducted in the air to now a much broader attack on uh, Serbia? Yeah, but I would warn against these small incremental measures in which we first go in with 20 uh, Apaches and then 2,000 troops and then we slide in another bunch of troops if we are going to use ground forces. And I don't know whether we have to use them, but we certainly ought to get them ready. We ought to start doing it now. It is uh, one way, an important way of affecting uh, the calculations of the Serbian leaders. Let's take a look at what the president said today. Here's President Clinton earlier today talking about his decision to introduce military troops into Kosovo. In the end, everybody agreed that of a bunch of bad options, our military campaign was the best available option to show aggressive action, to keep NATO's word, to keep our NATO allies together, and to give us a chance to preserve our objectives. I guess that's a point. I may have misspoke there. I said troops into Kosovo, actually troops on the border of Kosovo. But, but Dr. Kissinger, experienced as you are with the use of helicopter as a, as a means of warfare in Vietnam, is it, is it credible that we can keep from having a ground force capable of striking and at least uh, freeing people who are captured when their helicopters are shot down? Uh, now that all of NATO is involved, and now that the United States has sent B-1s, B-2s, B-52s, if we do not prevail, the, any place in the world in which the credibility of an American promise is at stake uh, will go up, could go up in flames. And therefore, uh, it isn't a question of whether we should just put in troops to rescue servicemen that get captured. I think we have to assemble the forces that might be needed uh, for a ground operation. And I think the president speaks in such vague terms of lease of bad options, objectives. He has to explain what the objectives are. He has to explain that uh, there is only one, ob one strategy that is now feasible, and that is to win. What would winning look like in this, in this context, Mr. Secretary? I, uh, in this context, it means the removal of Serbian combat forces from Kosovo, uh, the return of refugees, and the establishment of some international status for Kosovo that is uh, under some sort of international supervision. Uh, nothing else can now, can now work. And, and to achieve that mission now would take what kind of deployment? I have no idea, but I think we should not do it in an incremental fashion. And, uh, the longer the war continues, after all, Serbia is a country of about of less than 10 million population, uh, with poor resources, a not very effective army, except against unarmed civilians. And now all of NATO, 90 NATO nations with high-tech equipment, have been pounding it for two weeks. And the longer this continues, the more the relative impotence of this high-technology warfare, which we have uh, saddled ourselves with, in the sort of conflicts that we are most likely to face uh, is going to undermine our position in many other areas of the world. It sounds like a, 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 a campaign which would be similar, almost following the paradigm of the Persian Gulf War, where we set about not to annihilate an enemy, in this case Serbia, or in that case Saddam Hussein's Iraq, but simply to regain what was taken and to do that with a large force as George Bush assembled with uh, Desert Shield and uh, the Desert Camp Desert Storm. Well, there's a big difference. So Kuwait was a independent country that was occupied. Kosovo has never questioned, nobody has ever questioned that Kosovo is part of Serbia. And it, it was a major decision of NATO to inject itself into this, uh, in the diplomacy prior to it. Uh, so now, uh, therefore, now to establish self-government for Kosovo is not the same as recapturing Kuwait. Uh, but 
that now has to be the objective because it's inconceivable that one puts the Serbs back in political right. control of Serbia and asks the refugees to return. And if the refugees don't return, and right. if the Serbs succeed in ethnic cleansing, then this whole operation will look ridiculous. But in, but in terms of, that, that, is, uh, that is certainly the case, that is, Kosovo is part of, and, world, and recognized by the world to be part of, of, of the greater Yugoslavia, but if we tell the Serbian troops they have to leave, we're in effect denying them their, 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 their sovereignty over that, that area, aren't we? Uh, that is uh, now the consequence of the strategy that's been pursued for months. Uh, and that it's the inevitable consequence of having started the aerial bombardment. After the ethnic cleansing and after the aerial bombardment, uh, it, you cannot ask the refugees to return to Serbian sovereignty. Uh, Can you imagine any Serbian government surviving a defeat of this consequence, of this magnitude, to have lost a portion of its country no, to a I UN don't. force? No, I don't, and therefore I don't think the issue of whether, Milosevic, whether we deal with Milosevic or not is one of the key issues. Right. You, you imagine if we follow the course you say we must now follow, which is to win this, to win this campaign and to regain uh, Kosovo's self-determination, or at least their freedom from Serbian persecution, will probably entail politically in that country of Serbia but, a change of government. But, Chris, if I may make one other point. Sure. We all talk about self-government for Kosovo, but uh, the Balkans is a whole mixture of ethnic groups uh, that have been thrown together there by a succession of wars. Uh, once uh, the objective in Kosovo has been reached, that will open the chapter of Macedonia, because in Macedonia there are 800,000 Albanians, and uh, it's going to be a problem to deny them what has just been granted to the Albanians in Kosovo. And when that happens, the Slavs in Macedonia, uh, who are almost exclusively Bulgarians, they will raise their demands. Mm -hmm. And so we may face the disintegration of another country. And therefore, the administration absolutely requires uh, some strategy for a political settlement of all of the Balkan issues before we are being dragged step by step into becoming the successor of the empires that used to govern there and who used to be, had at least one thing in common, that they were hated by the populations over whom they ruled. <laughs> You're talking about what the the, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, exactly. all those wonderful folks, all were well we are, remembered by but, history as well. But we are stepping into their shoes, into right. their shoes. So we're going to play the role the Turks played in the beginning of the century. That's a wonderful proposition. Not uh, yet, but that, <laughs> what the danger is right. that once we have achieved self-government uh, for the people of Kosovo, which as you, which I now support, uh, that we we. This is not the end of the, of the story. Then we have to consider what happens to the many ethnic claims that exist in the Balkans to avoid being triggered into crisis after crisis uh, uh, by this sort of issue, and especially by the issues that will emerge in Macedonia and maybe even in northern Greece. Thank you, Dr. Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State, former Director of the National Security Council. We are watching Hardball on CNBC. We all knew no one was uh, blind to the difficulties of having to carry forward with any kind of military sanctions. Now, that worked. Then the problems arose again this year. When the talks failed, we had a series of difficult choices. That was President Clinton earlier today. I have to ask about this question. Why do you think, Robin Wright, why do you think we're in Kosovo? I think there are a lot of reasons that have nothing to do, in fact, with Kosovo itself. I think we've seen in the post-Cold War world the evolution of what grounds justify intervention. For, for a half century, they were basically involved two principles. One was self-defense, and the other was when the United Nations declared it was uh, a threat to international peace and security. But we've seen a number of treaties and a number of crises that have led to the evolution of uh, new principles that say, a country doesn't deserve sovereignty, the right to sovereignty, if it doesn't treat its citizens well. That human rights now supersede sovereignty as the primary judge by which you have relations with a state. That's the first reason. The second reason is that Kosovo is in the tiptoe, the, the toes of, of Europe. For a century, we have spent 
United States and the Western world trying to unite Europe. That was what World War I, World War II, and the Cold War were all about. And so at the end of the century, we don't want to begin a new era, or what is heralded as a, a new millennium, a new right. century, by seeing Europe divided again, because our economic stability is in some ways related to Europe's. And so any political instability affects that. Uh, and I think also we find this is the one part of the world where we share the values that de of democracy and uh, right of free sp speech, right of uh, free freedom to worship, human rights, uh, free enterprise. And it, this is the model, the European-U.S. relationship. Do you know how long it's taking you to Wait say that? And can you imagine trying to say that, Robin Wright, to a mother who's just lost a kid in Kosovo? A, d a mother of a soldier? American. Well, I mean, That's you know, the problem. I mean, Killen got elected with the theme of keep it simple, stupid, which is to keep the economy stupid. How do you keep this one simple? Well, to a certain point, you can say it's the economy stupid. This is where our economic future lies. And if we don't have peace and, and stability in Europe with the United States, then we're not going to find it anywhere else. Let's go to Alan Lichtman. You said something during the break about the politics of this matter. I think it's all over the place. The Republicans staking out the position on the right against the war completely, hands off. You've got Al Gore saying, please, God, don't put, get, have this happen on my watch. I don't want to play defense on this one next year. Tell me about your view on that. Yeah, they're all wrong. It doesn't matter at all the day-to-day uh, -day ups and downs, where the polls are going. It only matters where this comes out in the end, if that's six to eight months from now. The presidential election, in my view, will be decided on the battlefields of Yugoslavia, not on the campaign trails next year. Here's why. Right now, the Democrats have some pluses and minuses. They're the incumbent party, and the people are going to vote up or down on the incumbent party. Their big plus is the economy, their big minuses are the scandal, and their inability to get an agenda through the Republican Congress. So things are at stalemate now. And if Kosovo turns out to be a big foreign policy disaster, it will make it impossible for any Democrat to get elected in 2000. But if somehow this turns out to be a major American triumph and they turn it around, then Al Gore will be nominated and will be the next president. What is the likelihood of a great American challenge? We talked to Dr. Kish before he said that we're lucky to get back and we pushed the Serbians back across the Kosovo border and stand guard duty there along with our NATO allies in perpetuity. That's a victory? I'm not sure that's a victory, but if you can turn those faces around, if you can bring those people back into Kosovo, the glorious, great, if they're grateful like to the United States. So make that's them look right. like Kuwait that's and the people right. coming that would, back. That, of course, if you toppled Milosevic, that would even well, that be would better. that would be a heck of a war. How many, how many casualties can we take and still call it a victory? I wouldn't put any given number, but don't underestimate the resolution of the American people. A few casualties are not going to make this turn. Let's go to New York to Gary Cocolari with the Albanian Heritage Foundation. Sir, what do the Albanian Americans think we should be doing with regard to this? Well, what is your reaction to what happened today, sending uh, 2,600 troops into, into Albania? I'm all for it, and uh, I think the Albanian Americans, and more importantly, uh, the Albanians that are suffering on the ground in, in Kosovo and the refugees in Albania and Macedonia, I think if you ask them, they're going to tell you that they're happy the bombing started and they want it to continue. And I don't think we can accept anything less than totally, total victory over... And, and total victory Russia. would mean what? And what means would we use would to get there? That, it would mean that we don't negotiate with him, we dictate to him. We do what? Uh, it would mean whatever it takes. If it takes sending ground troops in there, that's fine with me. If it takes arming the Kosovo Liberation Army, that's fine. If it takes a combination of those, that's fine as well. How many, how many American casualties is it worth? Well, you know, I feel, I'm, I feel very strongly about that. I am an American. Uh, my family served this country right. in various wars, right. and I don't want to see American boys die. But by the same token, uh, I think there is tyranny going right. on here. People have had their political rights.